So welcome to our Eurosite Remote Sensing webinars. It is a third webinar, the second series. So it's already six uh, webinar uh, focused on remote sensing organized by the Eurosite Remote Sensing uh, Support Group. Uh, our uh, today's topic is European Union's habitat suitability, probability modeling and mapping and the European Vegetation Archive, EVA, and it will be presented by Sander Micher and Stefan Hennekens from Wageningen Environmental Research in the Netherlands. And I'm uh, Wojtek Mruz from Eurosite Secretariat, and I will host this webinar uh, on behalf of the Eurosite Network. And before we start with our presentations, I would like to say a few words about our network. So Eurosite, the European Land Conservation Network, uh, what we stand for. Our main mission is to provide opportunities for practitioners to network and exchange uh, experience on practical site management. And we are operating already for more than uh, 30 years since, since 1989. So as you can see, we are focusing on practice and building kind of bridge be between practitioners, site managers, decision makers, stakeholders, uh, and uh, researchers. So the main mission is also to, uh, to make Europe such a place where nature is paid, paid for, protected, restored, and valued by all. Within our network, there are 72 members, and these are uh, 31 uh, organizations, both governmental and non-governmental, uh, and uh, 31 individual members. So it's a kind of mixture of organizations and just private experts and uh, persons. Uh, and uh, we are in 40, uh, 24 countries across uh, Europe. We are closely cooperating with International Land Conservation Network. We are involved in United Nations Global Pitlands Initiative. So our main focus is networking, communication, biodiversity conservation projects, for example, within a uh, life funding scheme, Interreg uh, Horizon 2020, and our today's uh, uh, webinar is organized within a life uh, NGO funding uh, scheme supported by European Commission. So we focus on ecosystem restoration, natural 2000 size, and any other protected uh, areas. And our secretariat, uh, based in Tilburg uh, in the Netherlands, is created by five staff members. And one of our core activity uh, is facilitating working uh, groups created uh, by our uh, by our members. And uh, there are uh, six such uh, working groups uh, focused on econ economics and ecosystem services wetlands and climate uh, change, uh, management, uh, management uh, planning, remote sensing, and this is the group that is organizing today's uh, webinar, remote sensing support group, pitland restoration and management, and agriculture uh, and biodiversity conservation, the newest one. Uh, and I would like to, uh, to introduce now uh, the chair of our working group, our uh, remote sensing support group, a uh, great expert on biodiversity uh, monitoring and, uh, and uh, from Wales, uh, Clive Harford. Hello, th uh, thank you, uh, Wojtek. Um, okay, as, uh, as Wojtek says, I'm, I am the chair of remote sensing support group and I, I will just say a few words about the group uh, before I introduce the, our speakers for today. Uh, the, the group uh, was established in 2019 with the aim of uh, providing a, a bridge between the remote sensing uh, specialists and technicians uh, and conservation practitioners have been identified that there was a, a gulf between 
uh, these two disciplines. Um, the suggestion arose from a monitoring workshop, which was uh, looking at the, the, the role of new technologies in uh, nature conservation monitoring. And <clears throat> as a consequence, uh, the group was established. And since then, we have uh, set about establishing a series of hubs throughout Europe, uh, sort of information for, for information exchange between remote sensing technicians and conservation practitioners. Um, unfortunately, of course, uh, COVID has got in the way a little bit, which has prevented us holding live events. But the, the plan is that uh, as and when the situation improves, I mean, hopefully later in the summer, uh, if, or if not, maybe next year, but um, hopefully later in the summer, at least, we'll have some face-to-face -face meetings where um, the remote sensing technicians and uh, conservation practitioners can meet up and uh, have surgeries to discuss issues relating to these things. At the moment, we have hubs uh, nominally set up in 13 countries across Europe with the uh, with the intention that people can communicate in their own language. It will not have to be held in English and that they can be held locally so people do not have to travel too far and they don't have to stay overnight. So th this is what we are hoping will happen. Uh, <clears throat> until that situation arises, uh, we, we have prepared this series of webinars. Uh, as Wojciech said, this is the sixth one now. We held three in the spring and three in uh, three sorry, three in last autumn and three this spring, and this is the last of them. So, okay, um, I will now introduce the, the speakers for today. So, the first speaker is Sander Mucha, who is the Senior Researcher in Remote Sensing and Geoinformation at Wageningen Environmental Research. He has been active for 25 years in the field of remote sensing and uh, has been involved in many national and international activities with a strong, strong accent on vegetation mapping and monitoring, especially for agriculture and biodiversity. Uh, his co-presenter co today is uh, Stefan Hennekens, who is a vegetation scientist with 30 plus years of experience in the field of eco-informatics on a global scale. He has uh, gained a lot of experience in software and data-based development. And during this time, he developed the TurboVeg software for managing vegetation data, which is used throughout Europe and beyond. So I, I will hand over the, to these two specialists and uh, allow them to uh, take their presentation. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's a good one. And there is the share. Okay. So you don't see the next slide, just uh, the full screen. Yes, that's correct. We don't. We just have the title screen. This is perfect. Okay. So. Okay. So thank you, Kai, for the introduction. Um, we have uh, quite an uh, intense uh, presentation. The content is um, yeah, a little bit on the background, uh, why European habitat modeling and mapping. Also a little bit on our perspective on the history of European habitat mapping, especially related to the to our own uh, projects. Uh, also about the UNIS, the European Nature Information System, uh, the European Vegetation Archive, which is the backbone of our presentation and our modeling approach. Also about essential biodiversity variables. Maybe you have heard about this initiative of GeoBOM but also the initiative to have uh, remote sensing enabled and essential biodiversity variables to support the uh, monitoring of the biodiversity. And of course, our method uh, related to the European habitat suitability modeling. 
and how we go from habitat suitability to probability maps and what's next. And if we have time, we will also, uh, Stefan will also uh, provide um, a live demonstration of the uh, community portal in which you can, everybody can uh, make their own uh, European habitat maps. So the background, if we start with that, yeah, I think it's clear for everybody. Yeah? The extent and the quality of European habitats have declined largely over the last decades, but in, in fact, it's still continuing. Yeah? And pressures are caused by intensive land use, climate change, pollution, over exploitation, fragmentation, invasive alien species. So a lot of pressures on, on the biodiversity and therefore we have a lot of uh, policies also to that target the restoration of at least 50% of degraded ecosystems. That was the target too in the EU, EU 2020 biodiversity strategy, but also the AG target five uh, to, to stop the, the rate of loss uh, of the natural uh, habitats, at least by th that it would be half, but you see, see that these targets uh, ha haven't reached their goal yet. And so in the EU 2030 by the first strategy, it's all reconfirmed. But the problem is of course that for monitoring habitats and taking conservation measures, it requires that the location and the extent of all European habitats is known. Uh, and one of the problem is that still the ex exact extent and spatial distribution of European habitats is still not well known. So a lot of actions still have to be taken. And of course, uh, the Article 17 database is a very good example related to Natura 2000 habitats uh, on, on the distribution of, of uh, European habitats. But of course, it's on a 10 kilometer grid and it's only related to protected sites. Well, a large part of the, of the biodiversity and of the habitats are also occurring in the wider countryside. So not only in protected sites, but also outside protected sites. And information on their distribution and extent is, is uh, yeah, we need that. So we need to have a European wide approach for mapping European habitats. Um, if we look to the history of European habitat mapping uh, from our perspective in, 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 in all those activities uh, we have been involved, um, yeah, I will uh, sequentially go through them. Uh, one of the first big, uh, I would say initiatives which started already in the early 2000s is the map of the natural vegetation of Europe. It's a, yeah, it's a vector map with the distribution of the plant communities and there's a lot of work in it. It has more than uh, 619 uh, classes and it has also a lot of information about uh, characteristic uh, species behind it. So there's Already in this kind of maps, there's a lot of uh, expert knowledge, but this kind uh, of maps are more related to the potential uh, natural vegetation than of course the actual situation of the habitats. So therefore one of the initiatives that we started already in uh, 2004 was the PINHAB project which uh, support the work on a pan-European ecological network, which stands for PIN, and that, uh, yeah, to design ecological networks, you need information about where habitats are located. And we started using land cover data uh, and then combining that with indicator species, site conditions, and many other uh, layers of information which were combined in decision rules to come to specific uh, Annex 1 uh, Natura 2000 habitat types. And those decision rules were, of course, uh, partly related to this description of the Natura 2000 habitat type. And on the right side, you see an assessment of that methodology, but the methodology that we used here is a very much 
top-down approach, so starting with the land cover information and then adding additional rules. And on the right side, maybe it's difficult for you to see, but the resulting map in red is, is an overlay of uh, the potential natural vegetation map, which I showed before, and the results from this modeling, top-down modeling results. And you can see on the right side in green, you can see uh, data from uh, uh, the French national habitat mapping. Uh, that it's already getting quite close um, to, to, to the actual situation. And also for within the PINHAP project, we made already uh, a CD-ROM with an inter uh, interactive uh, display in which people could um, have a look at the different uh, Natura 2000 habitat types in their distribution. Another initiative, I think it's also well known to all of you, is uh, it's related also to the mass uh, um, uh, project, is the map of the ecosystems types. That's at units level two, and it's very much based as well as a as, as, uh, PINHAP project on uh, downscaling land cover information. So it's a wall-to-wall -wall map but limited in the amount of uh, habitat types. And these kind of uh, ecosystem maps will also be updated and will also be used for uh, designing ecosystem services. Uh, the eBone project was another European project that was more related to uh, general habitat categories. And the methodology was very much inspired on the UK uh, countryside survey in which uh, Bob Vance uh, did have a lead. And here in, in, in this kind of initiatives, the um, approach is much more uh, a statistical um, uh, approach to, to get figures on the, on the amount of, of different habitats. And that's done by uh, a stratified random samples of one by one kilometer across the different uh, environmental uh, zones. And so if you have enough samples of one by one kilometer, for example, then you can calculate the total number of, uh, of habitats. So it can provide consist consistent statistics on habitats and maybe those statistics are better than any other one, but of course the limitation of this kind of approaches is of course that it's only related to uh, a small amount of samples across Europe. But also for this to, to, to uh, map the habitats within the one square kilometers, uh, did provide strict field protocols for field habitat mapping, um, and in fact, it was based on uh, different life forms and the combination of different plant life forms and non-plant uh, life forms uh, that define the uh, general habitat category. So on the right side, you see the final, uh, just a small part of the general habitat categories in this uh, example for uh, trees and shrubs. And then within each square kilometer, uh, the general habitats were being mapped by visual interpretation of aerial photographs, and then they were described by not only by the general habitat category, but also by different qualifiers, which could be uh, site qualifiers, but also management qualifiers. And once you had this kind of maps, you could also use this kind of uh, broad habitat maps for locating your vegetation plots uh, with, for example, within the center of the mapping units or in the center of the linear features. And also, uh, yeah, you would repeat those kinds of vegetation plots uh, once in so many years for monitoring purposes. This is what Richard told you already about is, is also uh, within in the, in the Biosource project in which we work together. It's, it's making use of a combination 
over the growing season of, of uh, multi-temporal, very high uh, resolution satellite data, but also in, in, in fact, did this, uh, it's, it's based on, on decisions. So you, you're building your different layers to come to the uh, final uh, habitat type. Uh, but of course, it's also because it's, it's a quite intensive process. So uh, Richard showed it for, um, for Wales as well. But it's based, it's, it's quite limited uh, in their extent. So you can use it very well for Natura 2000 sites, but for Europe as a, a whole, it's still not, I would say it's still not, probably not feasible. Um, some other work we did for the um, uh, Dutch coastal, uh, yeah, Dutch islands on, on, the, on the, in the Wallen Sea is here you can see um, the rule-based versus machine learning, because uh, um, what you can see here is a little bit that the rule-based classification system are very interesting, but at the same time, uh, with the machine learning, it provides a lot of opportunities. Uh, we can reach uh, the same accuracy or even a higher accuracy, but it requires a lot of in-situ data. So the in-situ data is very crucial when you start working with uh, machine learning. And that was also, um, yeah, in, in, in the different presentations, we saw a, a lot of interesting approaches, uh, but most of these approaches are useful at, I would say, at the regional or even at the, at the national level. But we need for uh, a European approach, we need a, a slightly different approach. So instead of top down, uh, we, start, uh, we decided uh, to have a bottom up approach in which the European vegetation archives plays a very uh, central role. So we're using the in situ data as the starting point. And that is used as a starting point for a European wide modeling uh, approach. And we're using the UNIS habitat types instead of the Natura 2000 or the general habitat categories as the um, um, classification system. Major reason for that is that uh, the UNIS habitat classification is much more comprehensive than the Natura 2000. Uh, uh, type so it's um, the UNIS is a pan-European comprehensive and widely accepted classification method of all habitat types and at level three you have 199 habitat types so it includes terrestrial freshwater marine natural and artificial habitats and below you see uh, in classification uh, an, an article in which also uh, Stephen Hennekens was involved and it shows also that UNIS has gone under um, a thorough review which started in 2012 onwards and that is also based on the data from the uh, European vegetation archive so in fact um, the UNIS habitat types were characterized for the first time in terms of their species correct uh, composition and distribution. Um, and that did that, yeah, in fact, that didn't exist before. So before the UNIS habitat classification was a nice list of habitat types, but didn't have uh, any description. Uh, a lot of information on the UNIS habitat classification, you can also find it back uh, on, on the internet. And now I will give the word to my colleague. Uh, Hello, everybody. So uh, let's talk a bit about the uh, European Vegetation Archive temptation to collect vegetation data. Um, is this in fact a centralized database of uh, European vegetation plots? And it is an initiative of the IVS Working Group uh, Europe, with, uh, the Vegetation Survey Group. Uh, which was established many years ago already. Um, so we are talking about vegetation plots. Here you see a, a man in action. He's not looking for his glasses or pencil, but he is really 
recording uh, a list of plant species that occur within this square. So um, the EVA database contains samples that were collected across Europe for more than 100 years. And um, each plot contains a list of plant species with cover values. So the EVA database is a pan-European network of more than 100 coll uh, collaborators from all over Europe. It is uh, constantly updated and managed by our institute and uh, a institute and university in the uh, Czech Republic and the Masaryk uh, University. So this database currently contains about 2 million vegetation plots comprising 43 million species observations. And through expert rules, uh, almost 1.4 million of those plots have been assigned to UNIS habitat types. I will not explain how this works because it would go too far uh, for this demo. And we were able to uh, identify about 200 terrestrial uh, UNIS habitat types and define their distribution and also define their floristic composition. So this is uh, the overall distribution of the uh, density map of the, of the EVA database, so the geographic distribution. Um, so it's, uh, Europe is, is quite well covered, except for Scandinavia and uh, the eastern part of Europe, where we have uh, less data. And here you can see the, the temporal distribution. So most of the plots have been recorded uh, after 1990. So this more or less quite, quite re, uh, recent data. We, but, but of course, we also have very old data, uh, actually from uh, the, the first uh, recordings have been from the beginning of 1900. So it's, uh, as I said, uh, we have an, uh, a tradition of more than 100 years now. So we are talking about the vegetation plots, but what, what is the concept of a vegetation plot? Isn't, it is in fact, um, a recording of the coexisting coexistence of, of species at a certain time at a certain spot. So again, a list of species at a certain date at a certain spot. That's that's the whole concept of a, of a of a plot. And of these plots, we have two million in our database. So here you can see the distribution of a certain habitat type. On the left side, you see a list of species with a, with a frequency. So for example, uh, in this case, uh, I have selected all the, the plots with uh, Fagus sylvatica, which is the, the beach. And um, it occurs in 100% of all the plots. And uh, OK, let not, let's now talk about the European habitat suitability modeling. Huh? So, so the input of this modeling is on one hand uh, are the vegetation plots, uh, so the 1.4 million plots, um, which are derived from the EVA database, covering about 200 uh, unit habitat types. On the other hand, uh, for the modeling, we also need predictors, and we have about 30, 30 predictors to do the modeling, including climate, soil, terrain parameters, and RS-enabled PDVs and also one anthropogenic, anthropogenic uh, parameter. And for the habitat modeling, we use the open source software Maxend. It's a kind of machine learning technique called maximum entropy modeling. Okay, so here we have a list of the predictors more in detail. So we have several climate uh, uh, predictors derived from the WorldFlim uh, database. We have uh, topography predictors like distance to water or the dam. Uh, we have several soil parameters derived from the soilgrids.org and a number of RS enabled EBVs like land use, uh, vegetation height, inundation, phenology, several, uh, several uh, variants, variables of uh, phenology, and also uh, leaf area index. And as last, the anthropogenic. Uh, predict the, the population density. So the last one we have applied for uh, um, units types that are heavily involved, uh, heavily uh, influenced by, by man, like arable fields. 
Okay, now my uh, colleague will take over for a moment, just for a few slides. Do not worry. Um, yeah, so so concerning the predictors, um, also remote sensing in, in general can provide a lot of information. The, the, if we look at the work of the essential biodiversity variables, that is work, uh, initiated by Gio Bon, and there's also a famous paper of uh, Enrique Pereira and uh, our colleagues on essential biodiversity variables that can in, in fact uh, support the biodiversity monitoring work. A lot of this information, of course, is, is being um, collected in the field, but it provides a lot of spatial and temporal gaps and uh, remote sensing can support uh, the, the work on the essential biodiversity variables. So together with um, Andrew Skidmore and colleagues, we started to work on uh, RS-enabled EBVs. So here you see the candidates in the paper from 2015 related to ecosystem structure, ecosystem function, species traits, species population, and community composition. So only for genetic composition, uh, remote sensing cannot uh, support uh, the uh, variables yet. Uh, but you can see a lot of uh, interesting ones. Uh, some of those predictors we are using already, uh, like uh, land cover, uh, vegetation height, uh, but you can also and vegetation phenology and leaf area index. But you can think of uh, and, uh, on the right side in the community composition also phenology is being used. But of course you can think of many more. So we are also working hard within the remote sensing com community to get a, a longer list of uh, prioritized uh, remote sensing enabled essential biodiversity variables in which in fact the whole remote sensing community can work and hopefully um, when we get such a, a list also there will be more um, a common effort of all uh, of the entire remote sensing community to come with a common uh, RS enabled EBVs that can support uh, that can support the biodiversity uh, monitoring. So also in 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 the yeah the coming time uh, we expect that we will have uh, more uh, RS enabled EBVs as predictors in our uh, spatial modeling work. Uh, so, okay, so we use the, the, the Maxent software for the distribution modeling. And uh, Maxent is mostly being used for forecasting the species distribution, SDMs, and actually never used before for habitat modeling. So, but um, species and habitats have a lot in common in terms of ecological requirements. Huh? So they, they um, species, may, uh, species may occur uh, on, on certain uh, abiotic uh, conditions and the same counts for habitats. So habitats also have a certain requirement when it comes to uh, the abi abiotic uh, circumstances. So this, uh, so we thought, so if you, you can use the model for species then you can also use for habitats. So it, especially if the habitats are in ecological terms, very well uh, defined. And so for the modeling uh, of, of a habitat type, we use a maximum of 5,000 plot observations. So we do a random sampling on the, on the database. Uh, we use it as presence data and Maxent itself adds 5,000 uh, pseudo absence points as, as background data. Um, but Maxent can also be used for future predictions actually. So, but we are not going to into that uh, in this uh, demo. So let me give you a few examples of uh, habitat suitability map. Uh, suitability maps have been produced on a, uh, with a resolution of one by one kilometer because it's, it's European wide. So here we have uh, the Alpine calcareous grasslands, which is, is of course located in the high mountains. And uh, this is uh, dry heath. 
so that's you know spread all through Europe, not but not in the in the south part, in the Mediterranean part. And this is the distribution of the beach forest on non-acid soils. So we have also, uh, as from the predictions we have done, uh, it became, became clear that RS-enabled EPPs don't have a, a high contrib contribution uh, to the modeling. So think why should we then include those RS-enabled EPPs? Well, if you compare maps with and without EBVs, there is a clear difference. It's not so clear if you see the overall picture, although the, the, the overall distribution is more or less the same. But if you look in detail, um, you can see that, uh, so the, the, in the, the, the upper map is, uh, is uh, without, without RS-enabled EBVs, and the lower map is with uh, RS-enabled EBVs. And there's a clear difference. So this, there's much more dif differentiation in, uh, in the map with uh, RS-enabled EBVs. So even though the contribution of the RS-enabled EBVs is not that high, it has a clear effect on, on the modeling result. Uh, yeah, once, yeah once, once we have the habitat suitability maps, we can go uh, one step uh, further. And that is by combining uh, again, the European habitat suitability maps, which is still um, not completely, of course, related to the actual situation confronted with the uh, actual land cover information. Well, of course, for, for the actual land cover information, you want to use, uh, the most detailed information at, at the European level, and that is uh, the, the um, uh, high resolution layers, uh, Copernicus high resolution layers, for example, uh, with, with a 20 meter resolution, but it's only available for a few teams like forests, like grasslands, like wetlands, water. Um, so we also, depending for, for specific habitats on Korean land cover information, but also uh, ESA is becoming very active on uh, uh, land cover information and the new products will get a, a resolution of 10 meter. So in, in the coming time, we will have um, yeah, still maps uh, ranging from 10 to 100 uh, meter. And um, so in, in fact, what we do is refine the suitability maps based on the actual land cover information, but then still for the actual land cover information, you have to make a decision, for example, if it's related to Korean land cover, to which habitats, uh, to which land cover types is that related. So what we did in fact is then confront the, uh, European Vegetation Archive, again, with the actual land cover information. And then we came with, uh, with the decision rules, which Korean land cover types are related to a specific U.S. habitat type at level three. And in addition to that, we used also uh, the Copernicus high resolution layer, if it was available. And you could also, think of other rules, for example, distance uh, to the sea. So in the, in the European habitat suitability maps, um, it, for example, we saw the, the coastal habitat still occurring uh, quite far in, inland uh, in the beginning. Well, based on the European vegetation archive, you could already say it's not occurring further inland than five kilometers. So we used, uh, uh, a very hard distance to the uh, to the sea border. And here you can see an example of how it works. Um, I don't remember which one it is, but I think it was uh, Woodland, but I'm not sure. But on the left side, you can see the, um, the distribution map. So you see the, uh, in fact, the, rec the vegetation plots from the European Vegetation Archive. In the middle, you see an overview and the detail of the uh, European habitat suitability map. 
and on the right side you see the refinement based on the elect actual land cover information so uh, the probability maps are the most refined uh, concerning the uh, on the extent of the uh, specific habitat types but still even with the probability maps the different probability maps of the different habitat types are overlapping um, yeah, just a, a, a quick slide to show you that we did also assessments of our uh, European habitat probability maps based on the Article 17 database. And you see in overall the, that, that the uh, overall accuracy is, is, is very high, but at the same time, it doesn't say too much to me because it, it uh, yeah, it, there's a very strong agreement on where, for which 10 kilometer grids, the habitats are, are absent. But anyway, it's, it's, um, it's one of uh, approach of assessing those kind of maps. But in fact, you can have a lot of discussions also about this kind of approaches, also the approaches used uh, that were presented before, I think, uh, slowly, all those approaches are coming together. So, so um, I think in, we, we are making use in the end of all the expertise together. For us, at least, what, what's next is that we want to get rid of the one, uh, one kilometer resolution and go to more like, like a 100 meter resolution for, for Europe. At the regional scale, you can even think of uh, 25 meter. And I think it's also interesting to integrate uh, the probability maps per ecosystem. So you get more a wall-to-wall -wall mapping. So you can also support the work on, on the uh, mass work on the, on the um, ecosystem map of, of Europe. So also that is coming uh, together. Um, and then the uh, last but not the least is- If there is time left, so maybe- yes. Maybe we sh shall first have a discussion or yes, and if there's time left, we can we can uh, briefly show the uh, web application. What do you think, uh, Wojtek? First the discussion or the demonstration? I think we have five minutes yet, and we'll have a question and answers uh, session later on. So you can proceed for five minutes. Okay, so I have to uh, let me see. I have to. And share my screen, I think. No, it was on my screen. You don't have to do that. Okay. It's visible. Um, do you see the web application? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Okay. I still have a, a menu bar on top, but I'm not sure if it is visible, visible for you. So you see the full screen. Okay. Okay, so this is a web application we wrote for a project, next year's project, uh, which has now, which has finished uh, last year or the beginning of this year, I must say. Um, so it's an application where you can run your own model. So on the left side, you have the, um, a, let's say an index with unit habitat types. Um, and on the, at the bottom, we have a number of, uh, model predictors okay so the first thing you do is to uh, select a um, 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 a, a unit habitat type so for example b1.6 so i yeah so we had, had so the fagus woodland on non-asset soil so the beach forest on, on let's say uh, calcareous soils and we have a number of predictors we can select so uh, we start here with climate uh, predictors uh, we have a number of soil predictors. We have topography. So for example, distance to water, which is uh, well, interesting if you're talking about uh, riverine systems. Uh, we have the digital elevation uh, map as a predictor and the distance to coast. If we are talking about coastal vegetation, this uh, is a good predictor to take into account. Uh, but for this Fagus woodland, we uh, only use the, the dam. And then we have a number of uh, RS-enabled EBVs for which I have selected only uh, 
a small number, but in fact, you can select all of them. Um, in general, these uh, these different predictors don't have a high correlation. So, if there are predictors that have a high correlation, you should choose one of one of the two. So, once you have selected uh, the predictors and the habitat type, you can run the model. Um, but I will not do that now. So I will go back to a recent calculation. So I'll take this one. Okay. So one of the things you can see um, as a result of the modeling, you can see the contribution. So you can see that, for example, 56% of the model is this explained by temperature seasonality. And for example, uh, potential evaporation, 10%. There is also 15% uh, explained by bulk density, uh, soil uh, density. And if you go to EBVs, uh, oh, that's interesting. They are not, sorry, I have to take another calculation. It wasn't that one. No EBVs were selected. So this is, this is another calculation. Um, and here you can see that Okay, vegetation height, yeah, vegetation height 9% is not too bad. Land use 11% and phenology is 0.9%. Uh, so it, it's, in terms of contribution, the, the contribution of the uh, EBV is not too bad actually, but in most cases it's, it's much lower. But as I have shown in the demo, in the, in the, in the PowerPoint presentation, um, the, um, the, the difference between using uh, EBVs is, and, and not using EBVs is, is quite striking. So another result of the modeling is a prediction map. And we have two prediction maps, yes, this is, okay. Oh, okay. So we have two uh, prediction maps. We have a fraction map, which runs from zero to, to, to one. And we also have, but it's interesting because the map is black now. This is, uh, I don't know why this is the case. This is very strange. It should show a map, but it doesn't. So I'm not, I'm not sure what's happening here. This is the fact of the Zoom uh, facility. I'm not sure. So <laughs> actually I want to show you the map and you can- It is really it. black. It's really- so We can use our imagination yeah, to yeah, see the map. It's very, very black. <laughs> So it doesn't mean that it's it's all over the place or it's it's occurring. <laughs> it's, it's nowhere occurring. I don't know. Okay, so this is interesting. So there's also graphs. Yeah, we can show the graphs, and this is for each of the of the predictors. You can see a kind of um, response curve. So how do the different uh, predictors respond to the uh, variation of the of the um, of the predictor and you also can download the results so uh, as, a, as, a, as a zip file and then a zip file you will find all the statistics and also the maps etc so maybe the prediction map is obtained in the other calculation i'm not sure uh, no it shows us it's it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting why this is uh, black uh, anyway, so you have to believe me. <laughs> but of course, you can run the, the model yourself. But uh, be aware that the, the 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 server on which the the models are running is not very uh, it's lightweight. So if multiple people are going to run models, then the server might get into trouble. So be aware of that. Um, yeah, this is the uh, why would wanted to show you unfortunately the map is not popping up but anyway uh, but if you could paste you the link to, to the application in, in in the chat so i think that everybody could it's, try, um, uh, it's in the it's in the uh, the link is in the in the, in the presentation yeah okay yeah <laughs> so it's better not to show it now because otherwise everybody will uh, <laughs> try to run a model at the same same time so we might run into <laughs> trouble <laughs> Definitely. So I think that we can slowly move on to uh, the questions and answers uh, session. Uh, 
Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for this great and very, and very interesting presentation. So we will try to, okay. Uh, so uh, we've got uh, two questions uh, asked by uh, Bojana Ivošević uh, from Biosense Research Institute in Serbia. And the first question is uh, that uh, I'm just reading. Uh, I'm very much interested in getting these detailed maps for my country for various purposes related to my PhD studies. I'm a drone operator and I'm using detailed uh, UAV land cover maps, classified auto photos uh, that can cover a small portion of land. Which maps from all presented would give me the best spatial resolution uh, and are they free to downloading? Yeah, so so the, the application that uh, Stefan was showing, the European uh, habitat uh, modeling approach, she can run the model, she can select uh, the specific uh, habitat type she's interested in. Then she can run the uh, the uh, the uh, maxent modeling. She can also play with the predictors, seeing what what gives her the best results for her country. And then she will has she will have the uh, habitat suitability maps. And then the best is to use this to confront those habitat suitability maps with actual land cover information. So to refine the suitability maps to the land cover. And of course, uh, the more precise land cover information you have, the better it is if you confront that with the suitability map. So that is one way um, of, of um, yeah, getting, a very, um, uh, getting the, the habitat maps. And of course, the other approaches could be using the in-situ data, confronting it with Sentinel-2 uh, data or what, or what Jose has also showed or what Lucas has showed, but probably that is a much bigger effort if she wants to do that as a national scale. So the, the most simple method for her is do the modeling in the cloud uh, that we default, confront that with your actual land cover information from your country and then you have already uh, an ID. But if she runs into trouble, she can always contact us and uh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. But I, I, I once want to stress once more that the suitability map is not giving you the actual distribution. It's just telling you whether a grid cell is suitable for a certain habitat type. But so that doesn't necessarily mean that it really occurs there. So that's why we have to take step to the probability maps, which is more going uh, to the uh, actual uh, distribution. Mm -hmm. And there's another question uh, from Bojana. Uh, if I have uh, 32 study areas in Serbia from which I have collected a uh, hoverfly species in transects of one kilometer in two years, is it possible to get vegetation species uh, from uh, those study sites? and combine vegetation maps with this insect uh, species to predict their distribution in Maxent. Um, yeah, I think if, you, if you're really working on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a national scale, even local scale, then you need also predictors for that, uh, for those sites or for those uh, areas. And, and then you, um, and if you have, if you have those predictors, then you can, together with your observation data, you can, uh, you can run the, the maxed model there. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I mean, it doesn't make sense. I think, yeah, you could try, but uh, I'm not sure because we only have those predictors one by one kilometer on a European scale. So if you were trying to focus on a, on a smaller area, then I'm not sure what the result will be, but it's, it's worthwhile testing, but uh, it, would, it would be better to, to have a, a prediction data that is more focused on, on your area of interest. Mm -hmm. much more, and I, it will give you much more detail. And so you will have much more precise predictions concerning those insect distributions. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. so so you, can, you can even have a discussion eh? because because also at, at the regional scale i would say that that um, yeah, yeah the work that i have uh, presented uh, last year on, on the combination of lidar and very high resolution data or what what richard or jose has presented so much more uh, focusing on on the remote sensing work at, at, the, at the regional level uh, can provide already uh, quite detailed information, uh, I would say. But you need to have yeah, the expertise yeah, on, on, the, on the different topics. Mm -hmm. And we have a, a short and, comment uh, in, in our and, chat from Boyana. Yeah. I have predictors such as soil data. This, is, this was the comment from Boyana. Okay, I, I have uh, I have two more questions uh, asked by our working group members. Okay, so first is uh, by Alan. <laughs> Dear Sander and Stefan, uh, this is such a good summary and an interesting talk. A number of predictive uh, models have big problems with collinearity correlation between input variables. And many remote sensing uh, indices uh, and variables are co correlated. Has this been a problem in the model uh, or is Maxent robust to collinearity? Uh, <laughs> okay. it, it is said uh, that uh, in this respect, Maxent is, uh, is robust, but uh, we did a correlation between uh, the various uh, uh, layers. And so we tried to avoid that problem. So for example, of all the 19 bioclim bio uh, predictors, we only choose six, which is already quite a bit. And the same with soil data. So we, we just excluded uh, the layers that are strongly correlated with other layers. Yeah. 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 Thanks a lot. And the last question, uh, also from Serbia, uh, from our Eurosite member, uh, Tiana Nikolic. Uh, are you using uh, Maxent model tuning uh, in your cloud or is it done by default settings? Um, more or less default settings. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, we choose, we have 5,000, uh, maximum 5,000 plot observations and 5,000 background data. And yeah. But we have to, uh, the problem is that uh, we are dealing with 200 different uh, units habitat types. And actually, uh, you would have to find out what the optimal uh, settings would be for each different unit habitat type. So for this, we have uh, chosen the uh, choose the, uh, the, uh, the default settings. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. So I see no more questions. If anybody would like to ask something, please write it quickly. Uh, and I have one remark from my side. When I heard about the amount of, uh, of data in EVA archive, I was really surprised you said about 2 million. Uh, and, uh, and I wonder uh, how uh, it was possible to transfer data from national, let's say old databases. I, I imagine that it was tremendous work, <laughs> but yeah. how, how did you do that? Please explain just. Okay, so uh, I think the, the magic word is TurboVac. Uh, this is software program I started to uh, work on more than 25 years ago. And um, so we intensively use it for our own project in the Netherlands in the beginning. And then some people from abroad, there was a kind of Darwin initiative many, many years ago. And it was, uh, it was led by John Wattel. And he introduced me to a group of uh, European scientists uh, was among them was also Milan Kitri and uh, Milan Palakovic from uh, Slovak Republic and um, some people from Spain. So uh, there was already a group of people who uh, got familiar with TurboVac. So they learned how to enter the data in, in TurboVac. And um, well, I think the success of TurboVac is uh, it was, I think, uh, uh, well supported by me, but on the other hand, there is nothing else at the moment. So, uh, there, of course, there are other programs, but they are not so, um, it's not so widespread. So, but, um, so there were, an, an, there, there was a, a, an initiative of many national databases using TurboVac. So, 
in Poland, in Czech Republic, Slovak Republic, in Spain, in Italy. So there were many, many countries where Turmeric was used to build up national vegetation database. And when we uh, started to build up EVA database about seven, eight years ago, it was, it was quite easy to, uh, to bring all those databases together. The only problem was, and the biggest problem was the taxonomy because each national uh, vegetation database has its own, uh, was using its own taxonomy. So we have set up a, a kind of a taxonomic backbone in which we uh, synonymized all those uh, uh, taxon concepts. And so that was a, a big work with, that we have worked on for the last seven years. So it's, uh, yeah. So at the moment, uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's quite successful. But uh, of course, the, it's, it's especially the, 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 Czech people, the Czech people who are, are very dedicated and uh, yeah, so they are putting a lot of effort. So it's, it's me uh, doing the, let's say, doing more the technical work, so developing the software and developing the database itself. But the, the filling of the database is, is much more done by the Czechs and they are hard workers. They, they know how to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can I can imagine because uh, in my PhD I uh, it's in Poland uh, some somehow 20 years ago I used some first versions uh, of Turbovec for vegetation mapping and phytosociological uh, brown black uh, uh, relevers and but it was also the challenge to think about this different taxonomy and find synonyms in in some cases so I can imagine when when, when you gather all of it uh, from uh, from Europe it well. It was challenging for sure, but well, I, I'm really, really impressed with that number uh, and this work. I remember from Poland that it was in the beginning it was very difficult because there were, much, were many different groups, many different people who didn't want to to work together. But I think at some at some point it, 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 people started to work together, and now uh, Poland has a very big database about I think eighty thousand plots or even more. I don't know what the latest. Uh, 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 number is but uh, yeah they uh, they have done a great job yeah absolutely yeah thanks a lot uh, so we are running out of uh, our time so clive <laughs> maybe you would like to have some final comment for the webinar and for for the whole series saying that through sure well firstly uh, thanks a lot to uh, sander and stefan for a really interesting presentation it's a, you don't realize how much information is out there actually. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah. Incredible when you see these numbers of uh, vegetation samples that are there to be processed and uh, and the way that you are pulling it together is fascinating. So, so yeah, that, that, that has been amazing. Uh, really interesting presentation. Um, yeah, I was also interested in the, uh, yeah, in, yeah, well, just, just, just generally, I guess, uh, about the, um, I've been looking at a lot of the UNIS stuff myself recently, and uh, um, I, I was fascinated actually by how many communities they were. I noticed they had, I was looking the other day and found they had 77 communities for Scree. For yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> In Britain, we have two. <laughs> Only yeah. it presented an hour overview uh, to, a, to a limited extent. <laughs> Because yeah, some, some of them are simply uh, un, unvegetated, so uh, we uh, we do not deal with that. So no, it is, but it, it it's a fascinating piece of work, and, uh, uh, yeah. and it is amazing how much information is out there already. When you start talking about million, you know, a million samples and uh, two million, one point four million, yeah, one, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so thanks. It's a really good addition to the uh, Eurosite webinar sort of series and it will have been recorded of course and be, will be available to people offline and from for me I often revisit these things because when you are hearing them you you, you don't have time to take everything in as you go along but uh, but the fact that they are recorded you can go back to them and sort of go through it in your own time so I, I would advise people to do this uh, um, so so thanks again I I, I would guess our Next webinars will be next winter. Um, so I think we are planning an autumn series. And hopefully, like I say, if things uh, continue to improve the way they have been, 
uh, certainly in parts of Europe at least. Uh, and if the vaccination program gathers momentum over the next few months, then maybe, I, I don't know, I don't know how hopeful we can be about doing some sort of live interaction stuff later in the summer, I don't know. I'd like to think maybe within countries we can do it, if not, if not between countries. I think within countries maybe is probably a more realistic goal, I guess. Yeah. But I, I'd like to think we could hold one in the Netherlands and that uh, you know, you, yourselves could hopefully be involved in that at, at some level at least. And, uh, we'll be in touch about that in the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, th thanks to everyone today for, for joining and uh, for, for participating and for the questions. And again, to Stefan and Sander for an excellent presentation. You're welcome. So I, I think we can finish it there. Okay. Yeah, so we've got our final slide. <laughs> so yeah, this is really the end of our second series. <laughs> Thanks a lot for, for your attention. And as Claire said, it always, uh, all of these webinars are recorded, so we can find it quite easily on our YouTube channel. If you write the Eurosite network, you will see all our webinars. So you can, even without any links, you can find it easily. So let's say in contact, we are coming back soon, I hope. Uh, if you have any ideas for further webinars, speakers, workshops, uh, and other activities uh, for our group, uh, write me or, uh, or Clive. And also, if you are interested to, to become a Eurosat member, you can visit our website and contact us uh, via info at Eurosite or uh, email. So, yeah. So, thanks a lot. This is uh, uh, the end of uh, our webinar series.